You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. What do you think about the Joey Gallo stuff? Because it, it got out, it was put out by one person, nobody else said it. The person that put it out uh, on social media has kind of backtracked on it a little bit, the idea that the White Sox were talking with and may go after a Joey Gallo. And I went and I looked it up, and I mean, a guy with a lifetime 199 batting average who hasn't had an OPS that justifies such a low batting average since midway through 2021, even though he's a plus defender, doesn't excite me very much. No, well, it, it's the same thing. When somebody asked me earlier in the offseason, what did I think about the Sox going after Cody Bellinger after he was uh, non-tendered, right? And it, it's one of those, like, Joey Gallo, for the right price, sure. You want to take a flyer on the guy? You want to take a flyer that he can go back to that that 2021 season where, you know, the batting average wasn't below the Mendoza line, where he's hitting home runs, where he's a plus defender? You want to give this guy a minor league contract? Beautiful. But when I heard one year for $10 million... That that made me sit there and go, well, what what are we doing here? What the, the, you cannot tell me that Joey Gallo at ten million dollars is a bargain, or that this is the kind of free agent that you want to go after? It just it, it didn't make a lick of sense to me, which is why I was so glad when I started not seeing it gain traction. When you're not seeing you know the Haymans and the Rosenthal's start you know pushing it out there, you're not, you're not seeing the, the given when Bob Nightingale says, yeah, this is a done deal. You watch these things go, but what I thought was funny about the whole situation was just how quickly the traction got, how starved White Sox fans are for any kind of action, that something like that became such a lightning rod in such a short amount of time for it to sit there and and, and really kind of take on a life of its own that the Sox were doing this. When I I really do think that Joey Gallo is the kind of guy that's going to get he's going to get a minor league contract because at least that's what he's earned at this point, right? He's earned a shot to come back and try and make a comeback, but he has not earned a guaranteed contract based on what he's been with the Rangers the past couple of years, what he was with the Yankees, even, even the little bounce back he had with the Dodgers, you know, and and how they used him. This episode of socks in the basement and every episode of socks in the basement that is for fans by fans and 30 minutes of socks available anywhere. Podcasts can be found and always at SocksInTheBasement.com is brought to you proudly by Family Waterproofing Solutions. Bowing walls, window wells, foundation and crack repair, sump pumps, gutter cleaning, anything to keep your foundation safe, your basement dry. They do it. They do it well. They do it at a great price, and they'll take additional money off if you mention Socks in the Basement. Give them a call 24-7, 708-330-4466. Your basement's best defense is at FamilyDry.com. Ed, I, I want to start off the show with a little bit of math. Do you, do you mind? A little loose math here to, to kick off the weekend L- on Socks in the Basement? A little loose math? A little not, loose not some math. socks math, a little loose math? No, it's just some basic, like I'm just going to kind of throw something out there because I'm so frustrated with the White Sox. And I, I've, I've had people like try to debate me over, oh, it's not just Han and Williams' fault, it, it's the owner. And then I've had other people go, it's not the owner, it's Han and Williams. It can be all of them. It really can be. But uh, Jerry Reinsdorf got 250 kids college tuition through his philanthropy and won an award during the winter meetings. That was like the big moment. I mean, and everybody's like, well, at least he's a great philanthropist. Terrible owner, right? I mean, 40 some years, he, he's won the pennant once. He's got very few chances to actually win a World Series because he's barely in the postseason. He's lowering the payroll when your expectations were, this is when you were supposed to be going for it. He forced Tony LaRusse on people. I can go on forever. It's a half-hour show. I could talk for two hours about all my problems with Jerry Reinsdorf over the years. Let's just say that every episode of Socks in the Basement is available online, and you can listen to Chris <laughs> talk for hours right. on end about his problems with Jerry Reinsdorf. Right. I don't want to get into it all again, but I do want to address the 250 college tuitions that are such a great accomplishment for this billionaire who all you have to do is Google it. His net worth is reported at $1.8 billion. $1.8 billion with a B. All right? He gets 250 through philanthropy where he didn't foot the bill. I'm sure he raised this money through events and things like that, right? He didn't foot the bill. He could have 
Because if you have $1.8 billion, and let's say, I, I looked this up, the average public college in this country is around $21,000 a year. So let's round that up to 25 G's, give them four years to go to school. That's $100,000 a, a kid times 250, you got $25 million. Wow, that's a huge number. Jerry Reinsdorf came up with $25 million. Compare that to $1.8 billion. Let me just drop off four zeros on each side. Let's, let's make this more comparable. Let's say you have $180,000 in the bank. Your net worth is around $180,000, however you calculate your net worth. Like if you own a company, it might be worth a little bit more. If you're a paycheck-to-paycheck guy, you basically have to have $180,000 that's yours. And if you're still making payments on your house, that's not even part of your net worth, okay? Because you don't own it yet. Just whatever you have in capital in it, right? But let's say you got 180 Gs, which most of us don't have, right? Okay. If you have $180,000, the equivalent of having $1.8 billion and coming up with $25 million is if somebody with $180,000 came up with $2,500, which is one seat in the outfield for a full season ticket. How many of you go out and buy tickets and spend more money than what Jerry Reinstorf came up with comparably and won an award for? So shut up about the philanthropy as well. I don't care. All right. It's just another PR move and I don't care about it. That's my quick math for the day. I'm sorry. I'm done with these guys. I, I saw this thing online where somebody said, is this affecting your fanhood? When, you know, your fandom, are you, are you done with this team because of how they've screwed things up over the years and their inability to do anything during the winter meetings, Rick Hahn enjoying himself by the pool, obviously, because he wasn't doing anything. And you look at the payroll being reduced and you have to deal with all the propaganda and the insult of anybody that works for, let's say, NBC Sports, who's majority owned by Jerry Reinstorf, trying to put positive spins on things like there was that quote from Hahn earlier on in the week where he talks about maybe we'll make a blockbuster trade, but maybe we won't. No, th that's not even what he said. That's not even what he said. He said we just have to be mindful that blockbuster trades can happen. And and, and everybody else gave the full quote, like when they put the thing out, right? But Garfine just puts out the blockbuster trade part of it and then hides the, the, the stuff that pulls the rug away in his secondary tweet. Okay, I mean, if, if all these things that insult you as a fan, if it's built up so much, are you done with this team, right? Are you done being BS? Are you done with the propaganda? Are you done getting getting things in your email that say, say like, do you connect with this player, but they won't ask you about what you think about the product that's actually on the field and you're pulling your hair out and you got a ticket agent that's, that's basically apologizing to you because they know, but they still got to do the job. And it's just, it's, it's miserable, right? It's miserable when you see the, what the Padres did. And they basically started in the same spot as the White Sox. And you look at what they are right now compared to what the White Sox are. And you see a guy like Manny Machado that you should have gotten if you wouldn't have cheaped out. And then you tried to spin it and you see Tatis who came up in your system and you see them still going out and making moves and expanding their payroll and going for it. And you see Rick Hahn sitting on his hands and the payroll going down. Are you done with your team? And the quick answer to that is, no. And the reason I'm not done with this team is I know that one day there'll be a different owner. I'm going to weather the storm. I'm going to keep my White Sox stuff up. I'm going to keep doing socks in the basement. I'm going to root for great moments. I'm going to try to hang on to the good stuff. I'm going to analyze it and I'm going to watch baseball because I love the game of baseball. Like I'm not going to enjoy knowing that my team essentially just wants to be a second place team with a puncher's chance at the playoffs. And then like, you know, a snowball's chance in hell of making it to the world series, because that's really what they are and how they're constructed. When you compare them to other teams that are in the American league and throughout all of baseball, that's what, the, that's what they are. I'm going to have hope opening day. I'm going to be like, Oh, maybe, maybe 17 guys on this 26 man roster. all have bounce back years. Okay. And Pedro Gafal, it becomes like the greatest tactician. In the history of baseball, and Jerry Reinstorf falls off a boat like Goldie Hawn in that old movie Overboard and then wakes up and gives millions away for big time acquisitions and, 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 and payroll moves and everything just takes off one day. Maybe I'll have that, that eternal hope as a fan, but I'm, I'm never giving up, but I'm also going to be a realist. And I think what I'm, I, I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm angered out. I can't come on this show and yell anymore about how inept Rick Hahn is and how much Kenny Williams just sits in the background but has been there for two decades 
and 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 really the World Series was great, Kenny. Thanks. I don't know what you do anymore. And this whole front office is to blame. Okay, not just Rick. Okay, you you all worked underneath this guy, and you all know what the payroll is, and you all know his tendencies, and you all know how he likes to run his team. So at this point. You should know how to spend the money you're given better than how you spent it and construct your team better than how you constructed it. And the owner's always going to be a terrible owner. And until he's dead, and that's not me wishing death upon him, but he's never selling the team. So until he's dead, this is what the team is. And, you know, maybe one day somebody else will be in there and they'll they'll clean house, whoever the new owner is. (laughs) They're going to walk in and look at these guys and be like, you're gone, you know? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what they're doing afterwards. They're all, they've all hitched their, their star to one guy and who's, who's old and getting older. And th- he's not going to be around when some of these people still want to have jobs. But other than that, all I can do is just watch the team at this point. You know, I mean, we got Jason Martinez on from Fangrass. We're going to talk a little bit about roster construction and payroll and, and, and payroll flexibility today on the show. We're going to take a look at, you know, this new kid that they picked up in the rule five draft. We're going to take a look at some rumors you know, and some possible acquisitions the Sox could still make, even though, you know, everything is taken with a grain of salt. But I, I guess I'm just angered out at this point. What else can you say about this team? No, nothing. <laughs> you just let me go. You just, <laughs> I love it. I love you. Just let me go. All right. Well, I'll, I'll let you talk in the next segment. The wood from this tree melts the ball. Deep to right field. Into the bleachers. Morningwoodbats.com is the custom wooden baseball bat company that'll help you smoke them over the fence. Wow! Check out our custom bat builder that allows you to pick the wood species, model, and color, and get custom personalized engraving that'll be drop shipped right to you. Put some life in your lumber with Morningwood. Morningwoodbats.com. 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 Do it today. I've only asked for two things this Christmas. One is to be allowed to get out my house, go to the bourbon trail with my boys, and drink bourbon for a weekend in Kentucky. I'd also like a bat from MorningwoodBats.com, like one of those cool retro ones, like from back in the day, up on the wall, collector's item, perfect addition to the nine-foot homemade oak bar down here in my basement. Sox22 is the code, 10% off on your purchases. Use that at checkout. On the phone line with me, uh, back on the show, been a little while since we talked to him, but he's a perfect guest for the offseason, especially coming out of the winter meetings where... I would imagine it was busy for Jason Martinez of Fangraphs doing roster resource work and and making sure that everybody was updated a moment by moment as all these moves were happening to teams other than the White Sox. How are you, Jason? I'm good. I'm uh, coming off of three really, really busy days, really fun days, and um yeah, there's still a long way to go. Just, just not. It's not going to be all all bunched into a, a couple of days here. So you must really appreciate that Rick Hahn kind of hung out poolside and didn't do very much this week because it was one team you didn't have to update very much. Uh, who who kept you the busiest? Like, what, what stood out to you in the winter meetings where you were like, wow, that team is is going someplace this year? It was kind of spread out a little bit. It wasn't like one team that dominated. I, th- I think looking at the Phillies and the Padres, two teams that were just like, they, they you know, watching the postseason, those two teams seeded expectations a bit and, and um, you know, where they looked like a team that, that barely snuck into the playoffs and then it was like, oh, wow. Teams, this team is really close, and they didn't stop. They just kept, they just had to keep going. Um, you know, there, there's certain teams like the Red, like the Red Sox, are obviously not going to spend on the biggest free agents, but they did. They put money into Yoshida, um, cost them over 100 million to get that guy, and then they made a few other moves to strengthen their bullpen. You know, like the Dodgers are going to do something, the Giants are going to do something, the Yankees are going to do something. And, you know, so it, it, it was chaotic, but it wasn't just like one team that, that kind of dominated. Uh, so at the end of it, you kind of go, oh, okay, oh, yeah, the White Sox did it to a thing. You know, we, we know Cleveland, he's made a run at a, Jose Abreu, um, and then, then they did bring in Josh Bell, and they're a young team that, that's probably going to continue to be good. Um, just the White Sox are kind of like, do we really have to do much? Because we don't, it doesn't seem like they want to spend is one of the things that is the hardest about your job keeping track of the team payrolls? Because I know that there's a lot of sites that try to like keep track of of team payrolls 
and what's owed in option years and how things all flesh out. I mean, for example, if I go take a look at spot track, their number might be a little different than what fan graphs has. There's a couple of different sites, a baseball reference. If, if you try to look at their contracts, it always looks like it's just a little different than you and spot track. How, how do you guys calculate it and figure out when you're trying to, to put out there for everybody, the team payroll, is it hard because sometimes it's vague what the terms are? It, it can be initially it, it, it could be vague. Most of these reporters are pretty good at, at, tracking down official numbers at some point um, where it gets a little bit more complicated now is um, these teams are getting creative and they're like, well, we're going to give you a vesting option. And, and if you don't uh, pick up this player option, then the team can have a club option. And there's like a bunch of different stuff that they're, they're throwing in there that's kind of weird. But as far as just tracking down um, guaranteed money, AAV, we can get pretty close there. And I think, I think when they, whenever the teams do something tricky, as far as like deferring money to lower the AAV, that's not always reported until, you know, that this is something that would come up. Um, like, let's say a team is, is getting close to that luxury tax and some of their decisions are now based on, you know, how, how far do we want to go over it or do we want to stay under? Oh, by the way, this reporter finally asked about this contract and actually the AAV is lower because they deferred money, money for, for the next 10 years or something like that. Um, so this stuff can be tricky. And it was, you know, honestly, it was something that I, I was tracking early on before the luxury tax stuff, just to kind of, you know, so teams could compare, you know, how much are you paying each of these players on your, on your roster? So let's compare, you know, this team who's paying 150 million compared to this team paying that's uh that's at 75 million and, and even if the numbers weren't official you can get a pretty good idea when when you're updating all these teams you must get a general sense for how a team is operating just by taking an overview like you're filling in all the the, the pages you take a look at a team page you go okay well this is a team that's solid you t- look, take a look at another one, you go, ah, oh, this is a team that's in a rebuild, or this is a team that's in transition, because it's probably pretty easy to see that when you've got it all in front of you and you're watching what they're doing. You just take a look at the at the White Sox payroll page right now. This is a team that supposedly just came out of a rebuild. 13 players in 2023 have guaranteed salaries. In 2024, take options out of the equation. Non-option contracts, there's six. And in 2025, there's one, one non-optioned contract that there's somebody still under just, you know that they're guaranteed and they're getting their money and that's Luis Robert. And then you look at a page like the Padres where those are filled in multiple years beyond that and it would not shrink down that quickly. Are you surprised to see where the White Sox currently sit in terms of their guaranteed money, the guys that are locked in and how quickly this team could be completely turned over. Yeah, the, the thing that stands out is, and, and, it, and it's not just the White Sox, a lot of teams were being very careful over the years to not be paying like Trey Turner or Xander Bogart when they're 38, 39 years old. Teams have been avoiding that, and it seems like a lot of teams have kind of reset, and now we're back to it. Uh, but that's just that's what it costs. That's what it costs to get those types of players. Um, and so you have a lot of teams without a lot of future guarantees. So, you, so I look at the White Sox and I go, oh, payroll flexibility here. Um, and they're the White Sox, the White Sox to be able to spend. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing we can't factor in is, is we don't know what these owners are thinking. We don't know. I mean, I'm not going to try to figure out what's going on in their, in their, in their minds. What, what, what's the difference between most of the owners and, and Peter Seidler, the owner of the Padres, who's, they don't have, it doesn't appear they have any payroll flexibility at all. And it was just like, I don't care. Let's go get Bogarts, and, and they were they were like, let's go get Aaron Judge, let's go get Trey Turner, let's get one of these guys. And the other owners do not think this way, so it's hard. So so we can look at this at a team like the White Sox, and, and and the Dodgers are set up this way, the Giants are set up this way. Not a lot of future commitments right now, and so you go, they, those two teams can spend now. They can they can add long term deals. They they can backload contracts if they wanted to, um, and, and you would think the White Sox would be able to do the same. Jason Martinez from Fangraphs and every guest here on Socks in the Basement brought to you proudly by the village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure. Visit the village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore, take a tractor around town and look at the Christmas lights or put your pet in a Christmas sweater. Yeah, they got a lot going on. See it all 
at LamontDowntown.com. Have you guys ever considered with all the different things that you have uh, on your depth charts, uh, roster resource, part of uh, the whole fan graphs package when you go to fangraphs.com, have you ever considered like trying to figure out what the team's revenue was like the year before? Because I, I find that very curious. Like I wonder how many teams run in the black when they figure out their payroll year in, year out. And it would be like a great way to be like, oh, well, they had this in their media contract and they had this in their, in their, at the turnstiles. And, you know, this is their, the general estimate of what they probably had in merchandise. And this is what Major League Baseball distributed to lower market teams and stuff like that. Is that something that you've ever considered or does that just seem like it's impossible to actually calculate? How, how open is Major League Baseball with those numbers? Uh, we had a writer for Fangraphs, Craig Edwards, um, he, he was a lawyer that came to write for us for, for a couple of years. And he would do I, he, at least once or twice. He did, he did a, a post on uh, a story on, on revenue and he was looking at TV contracts and things like that. And yeah, I, I'm sure it was a ton of research and he, 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 uh, he got hired by the MLB pay, P, MLBPA the players association. <laughs> he got scooped up right away. He was like the one guy that cracked it. Yeah. I mean, and that's the stuff that's like, Man, you, you got to dig in for that research and really understand a lot of stuff to be able to say, to be able to, to put out information like that. Because it's, it's like I said, it's not really, it's not a really a, a much that, that MLB is going to give us or give anybody or make public. It's like, you know, even with the stuff I have on the site, like service time, it would be so easy for them to just put out a list and say, this is official service time. And, and, and uh, they, don't, they don't put that out. They don't put out, you know, like things like Rule 5 eligibility and a lot of things like that. It's just like, it would, it would be helpful to me. Maybe I think like, yeah, most baseball fans don't care about a lot of this stuff. So they, they probably don't care either. Jason Martinez, nice enough to join us here on Socks in the Basement. You can follow him on Twitter. He's a good follow, uh, at Jason R.R. Martinez. Uh, although every once in a while he tweets something that breaks my heart, like today uh, when you put out the expected lineup when uh, Tatis gets back to the Padres. And you have uh, Tatis and Wright leading off, followed by Soto, Machado, Bogarts, Cronenworth. You don't know who the DH is yet, but who cares when you got Kim, Grisham, and Nola behind them? I mean, that's insane, and it breaks White Sox fans' hearts because Tatis was in our in our system and was given away for nothing. And Machado is a guy they should have had if they just would have given the same guaranteed money that the Padres offered, but they tried to cheap out. So, I mean, it, like it's tweets like that. Uh, every once in a while, like, oh, Jason, I don't want to see your tweet right now, but he's a good follow. <laughs> Check him out, and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris. Anytime. Socks in the Basement listeners, do the hard work. And if you're a hardworking man or woman on the South Side, you need to be outfitted properly. And that's why you should visit Red Wing Shoes in Evergreen Park, New Lenox, and Geneva. A work boots specialty store that carries sizes from 6 to 16 and feet as wide as 4E. A 115-year-old company that came out of Red Wing, Minnesota. And one of its largest stores in the entire Midwest is in Evergreen Park, Illinois, ever since 1976. When you're on your feet, the footwear is everything. So why not get an expert fitting? They warranty, repair, and offer free conditioning with laces. And they also carry Carhartt work clothing as well. Located at 3347 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park, Illinois, at 208 East Maple Street on Route 30 in New Lenox, or at 1749 South Randall Road in Geneva. Visit them today. You work hard. You've earned it. Red Wing Shoes. Actually, Jason Martinez got to add one guy onto the White Sox roster on fan graphs during the winter meetings when Nick Avila was selected in the Rule 5 draft. Spectacular mustache, really low whip, strikes out a guy every inning, dominated in double-A in the Giants organization. He's the perfect Rule 5 pickup. I like that. They have him projected to make the bullpen. They also send Jimmy Lambert down in their projections now on Fangraph's roster resource. Because even though you and I know that Jose Ruiz is not a good pitcher, Fangraphs understands who the White Sox are. That's brilliant. I had somebody tweet me this week and ask the question, do you think that gen different generations of White Sox fans view what's going on differently because of what they've seen so far? And, and I don't think it was a slight the way that it was written. I, you know, I, I know younger White Sox fans. I know older White Sox fans. I talked to my father, and I, I, I kind of do see it. 
I think that if you were like you and I were in our mid 40s, right? Let's let's say that you wherever you're at age wise, you experienced the 80s and just those terrible years. And then you watch them like build up in the early 90s and they were going to be something, but they never actually became anything. And the owner got in the way. He got in the way with the strike. He was like leading the charge on the on the on the owner's side. He was a big contributor to everything that went wrong. Uh, there was always promise, but they never went all the way. And now you're watching what's happening here ever since they started the rebuild back midway through the last decade and where this is at right now and the team's attitude right now when it comes to their money and their roster building, and you see people that have been there for far too long without getting real results, and it just feels like a repeat. So you view it as, well, they're the White Sox. They're a mess, right? And, and then you have people like my dad and my uncle who are in their 70s, and they look at it like, well, we had owners before this one, and you'll have owners afterwards, and maybe we'll outlast this one here. And this is just what it is to be a White Sox fan. And maybe one day there'll be somebody good. And they love to bring up the fact that the guy that ended up buying the San Francisco 49ers originally wanted the White Sox. But the big fear was he was going to turn into Steve Cohen with the Mets. So Major League Baseball didn't want him. So Jerry was kind of picked, you know, I mean, indirectly. I mean, however it worked out, that's the way the old men tell the story. I was little. I don't remember. But that's the way that they'll explain it. And then you have this younger group that basically grew up with the World Series champions, right? Like they were kids when they won it. They know nothing but joy early on. And this is the first time that the team has really screwed them. And they're not exactly sure who did it to them yet. So they're kind of arguing about it. They're not, they're not, is this real? I think that's what's going through their heads. Like they watched the White Sox win the World Series. Then they saw the Cubs do a rebuild and they watched it even though it wasn't their team because they all live in the same area and the Cubs are so close to the White Sox. And then they saw the Sox tell them, we're going to do the same thing as the guys on the north side. And they believed it. And this is the first time they've had the rug pulled out from underneath them. And they're confused. I mean, that's not a slight against any generation of White Sox fan. But I think that does kind of explain why Sox fans from time to time are arguing with each other over this because they have different perspectives based upon how long they've watched this team. Well, that's that's fandom. That's fandom. And I would say fandom, particularly in the city of Chicago, you have the 85 Bears, but you have Bears fans who remember Papa Bear still. Right. And they remember how the Hallis years and they remember, you know, all, all the stuff that went on in the 70s or is basically just we've got Walter Payton and nothing else. And and they're going to argue about they're going to argue with what's going on now with Ryan Poles and Justin Fields and stuff like that. So it, it's it's not just White Sox fans. But yeah, you are naturally going to be a product of your upbringing. You and I, in our age group, our real introduction to the White Sox, right, is the win and ugly, the 83 White Sox. We're little kids. And, and, and we're that we're is a, little kids watching yeah, that thing. Yeah. You know, and that's exciting. That's fun. That team was fun. Then they were terrible. Then they were terrible for the rest of the 80s. Yeah, they were an awful team, but it was it was fun for them to, to, to have that season, right? Uh, but then we watch as we're kids, we watch the White Sox flounder. We, you know, they don't do anything. But then as we're teenagers, yeah, you get that, ah, hey, here we here we go. What did they do? They got rid of Ribby and Rhubarb and they brought in the White Sox wolf. Good guys wore black again. They went with their marketing campaign uh-huh. and we got sucked into it, right? This is why we don't get sucked into this stuff now, because we got sucked into it, Ed. But we've but we've seen we've seen now, distinct incarnations. You and I, in our fandom, have seen distinct incarnations of Jerry Reinsdorf baseball, right? We, we have seen how he can be a little bit cyclical with this, how the team can have a certain amount of success, and then nothing. And then, the, the, you know, it's almost in spite of themselves, a certain amount of success, and then nothing. Whereas, to your point about your dad and your uncle and, and White Sox fans who remember Bill Veck, who remember John Allen, who remember, you know, a time before Jerry... They yeah they had some they had some seasons too, and they had some heartbreak and they had some stuff that went on in their youthful fandom, that Jerry represented a massive change and and yeah and and they've they've been through multiple owners which you and I haven't been through not really right well I think I think that the way that they look at it is before Reinsdorf they only went to the World Series let's say in fifty nine that's when they go right but when you talk that, to that, that generation. It. They look at owners like John Allen and they go, he did the most he could with the money he had. 
because he really wanted to win. That's how they'll, that's how they'll talk about him. A lot of White Sox fans are older. Right. They'll talk about Bill Veck as here's a guy who didn't have anything, scraped everything together as best he could, made it fun to go to the ballpark, and did everything he could with the money he had. He just wasn't rich. They look at Reinsdorf and they go, he's rich and he should be able to spend more money. And he didn't care and he didn't try and he didn't love the team the way the other owners love the team. That's the way that, that those that saw owners before Reinsdorf will talk. But to your point, then somebody who who grew up in a post White Sox World Series era or with with that being the team that shaped their White Sox fandom as a kid. OK, the way the 83 team shaped you and me. The 2005 team shaped them. Those guys, those fans are the concept of Bill Veck and the concept of John Allen, the concept of of a poor owner who loves the team and just can't just doesn't have the resources to put them over the hump. They don't get that. What they what they're growing up in an era of as well, if you think about it, is it's it's also a little bit of a different era. Because 70s, 80s, into the 90s, contracts are not what they are now. Money being spent is not what it is now by a long shot. You have more fluidity in free agency. You have a lot more going on where teams can build overnight, right? The Padres can take a tactic of spending on guys like Manny Machado and Xander Bogarts and you Darvish and, uh, uh, you know, importing guys like Hassan Kim still having, you know, a, a good farm system that they've been able to, to use to leverage in trades, going and getting guys like Joe Musgrove, you know, and, and having the capital to do that and being able to spend, or the Dodgers who can consistently outspend everybody or the Mets who are trying to consistently outspend everybody or for years, the Yankees who consistently outspent everyone. That is, is more of a product of what a younger fan is going to see. And I would be more frustrated if I'm a younger fan, knowing that Jerry Reinsdorf is on the level of some of those owners, that he could spend like that if he really, really wanted to and doesn't, I'd be frustrated, but I wouldn't have nearly the frustration level of somebody who's an older fan who watched two owners who loved the team and just desperately wanted to put something good for the fans out there. And to watch this guy basically sit here, collect money off the White Sox name, threaten at one point to move him to Tampa. Let's not forget that, that, that Jerry's the one that threatened to move him down to Florida. And, and, and sit here and drop payroll, but talk about his philanthropy. Or sit here and, you know, and, and rest on one laurel, which is the World Series. That's a great contrast to when we talked to the guys that wrote the Dick Allen book, remember? Oh, yeah. We sat down with them, we did a whole show, you can get it on demand, and they talk about John Allen. And they talk about how his whole goal was not moving the team. He didn't want the White Sox to be ripped away. Major League Baseball was the bad guy there. And he was trying to save the team. You have a generation of fans who saw that beforehand. And they're the generation, you don't really see them on social media, really. I mean, like it's not like my father's tweeting, right? Like They're the most interesting ones when you sit down and you have a conversation about the White Sox as a whole and as a, as a franchise. Again, they're the reason why I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere, right? I might be angry. I might be disheartened. It doesn't feel like as much of a punch in the gut as I think it feels for younger fans because I've gone through this before. They punched me in the gut in 94 the hardest, all right? We were going to win the World Series. According to literally everybody but Yankees fans, yeah, that was obvious. Yeah, 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 yes. Whatever. A lot of the moves that they made, okay, with that team, they had such a really good team, and they did a very bad job of finishing that team off, and the owner was one of the reasons for that. And and, and there's ne there never was, they were never all in. They never pushed their chips in. Like the guys who came before who owned the team, if they would have had the chips that Jerry Reinsdorf had, they would have pushed them in. You know, I understand that talking to dad and my uncle and other fans. In the before times. Right. Yeah. In the before times. Back in black and white. Okay. That's a joke. But I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean like, you know, back when, back then. Okay. In the olden days. Like, like they, they have that perspective and I listen to that and that's probably why I stick around because they're the ones that keep telling me, don't worry, this guy will be gone someday. He can't live forever. Yeah. In the meantime, crack open a few beers and let's uh, get ready to throw back some delicious Oscar Colas. <laughs> You've been waiting to use that one forever, haven't you? Oh my god, so so long, so long. Socks in the basement. Socks 
in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.